I mentioned to you last week that a good way to study the Bible is to look for repeated words or phrases. Um, in the middle of the book of Ephesians, all of a sudden, if you're reading in the King James, you, Paul talks about walk, walk in love, walk in unity, and he uses that. He says, "Oh, okay, that's kind of that kind of falls right into line there." Uh, in the book of Colossians, for example, the theme of the book of Colossians is that we are in Christ. And many times through that book, you read the phrases, in him, in whom, <coughs> in Christ, in the Father. And, you know, and it gives you that, that sense. We all know that 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. Why is 1 Corinthians 13 the love chapter? Because almost every verse has the word love in it. Uh, and, and so that repeated words give you insight into what the author is trying to tell us. Well, as you continue to pray for me, as I continue to wrestle with Solomon in the book of Proverbs, the Lord brought to mind as I was working on chapter 11 that principle, look for repeated words. And I found that at about 10 times, depending on the translation you use, in Proverbs 11, the word righteous or righteousness was used. And so last week, we looked at chapter 11 with that as our underlying theme, living a righteous life. And we defined righteous as being morally and ethically right, being obedient to God's law, not being perfect, but endeavoring to live pleasing to God. And we mentioned that the only way to truly become righteous is to confess our unrighteousness, our sin to God, and accept his forgiveness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be the sin offering for us, so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. So as I continue on into Proverbs chapter 12, I notice that in these verses, at least nine times, the word righteous or righteousness is used, or the word upright, and similar words are used. And so I said, huh, he, he's contrasting whether you're living a righteous life or whether you're living a wicked life because almost every verse in Proverbs 12 has the word but in the middle of it. And you may remember three or four weeks ago, we studied the contrasting Proverbs, the Proverbs that contrast two ways of living, and they have that word but in the middle of it. That would be an interesting way to study Proverbs. Just go through and notice every time he says but, and contrast what he's saying on either side of that word. And so we're calling this today two ways of living, but as I said to you when we wrapped up last week, basically in this chapter, Solomon gives us a test on are you living a righteous life? And he contrasts righteous way of living and a wicked way of living. <coughs> as we go through this, you'll notice that he repeats some of the same themes that we've looked at earlier in the book. So, here we go. Questions to help us determine, am I living a righteous life? Question number one, how do I react to discipline and correction? Verse one, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Now, the King James uses the word brutish, B-R-U-T-I-S-H, like a brute beast. In other words, he's saying, Whoever hates correction is like an animal that you can't train, that you can't correct. Now, the word discipline there, we've come across several times in our study of Proverbs. It basically means moral training and instruction. To train somebody how to live a morally correct life. When the Greeks translated this word into the Greek translation of the book of Proverbs, they used the word that meant bringing a child to maturity. So that's what discipline is. Discipline is helping a person know how to live right, bringing somebody to maturity. Now the word correction is a slightly different word. It means to be shown the way, and it carries with it the idea that if you don't follow the way, there may be some sort of chastening involved in that. So Solomon says, you can tell if you're righteous or not, by how you react when the discipline and correction of the Lord comes your way. Now, he says, loves discipline. 
I'm not sure that anybody really invites discipline into our lives. You know, I, I don't know very many people who, you know, when they get corrected, say, oh, goody, you know, I'm being corrected. I just can't wait to be corrected again. You know, no, we, we usually don't like that. But what, the, what Solomon is saying is a, a wicked person, a foolish person, casts away the value of discipline and correction because it's uncomfortable. But the wise person, the righteous person, accepts the uncomfortable because he understands its value. In other words, the righteous person understands that if I'm going to grow, if I'm going to develop, there's going to be some correction along the way. There's going to be some discipline along the way. Solomon echoes this same principle in verse 15. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. And I stuck back in your notes some of the verses we looked at last week about the importance of having good counselors, good advisors in your life. But Solomon says, the person who's foolish, his way seems right to him. You ever known anybody and you, you said about them, you can't ever teach them anything, you can't tell them anything? You know, the, the way of the fool is right in their own eyes. Wise people, righteous people, listen to advice. So that's question number one. Are you righteous or wicked? How do you respond and react to correction and discipline? Question number two. How does my life impact others? Everybody has an impact on other people. What kind of an impact do you have? Verse 4. A wife of noble character is her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. It's an interesting verse. When, when I was first you know, wrestling with chapter 12, I thought, well, that's talking about marriage, that's not even involved in this at all. But then, no, he's talking about how your life impacts other people. And what he's saying there is that the moral character of a wife affects her husband's enjoyment of life. And the idea of being a crown has with it two, two ideas. One is dignity. You know, all of us who are married know our wives add dignity to our lives, or not, depending on their character. But I also, when I dug into that word crown, and I stuck it in your notes because I didn't want you to miss it. The word crown comes from a word that means to encircle for protection. And I have in my notes in capital letters, wow. Here's what he's saying. A good wife, a wife who is tuned into God, will be a circle of protection for her husband. Here's what I mean by that. Not real often, but more than once or twice in our ministry, maybe a, a new person had come into the church. Maybe a couple, maybe a woman, had, a new female had come to the church. And after a couple of weeks, Donna would say to me, be extra careful around that person. Be really protective. Make sure that you add some extra layers of protection in any kind of dealings. There's just something not right. Because see, God gives women who are in tune with him some insight that us guys sometimes don't pick up on. And, and I, I tell husbands all the times, if your wife's a Christian, listen to your wife. You know, in those kind of situations, Listen to her. She, God gives her insight that she doesn't necessarily give you. Now, not necessarily on every thing, but on those kinds of things. You know, the, the wife is a crown of protection around her husband. Listen to your wife and she says, watch out for her. You know, watch out for them. You know, pay attention because they know. But he says a disgraceful wife, on the other hand, and one that puts him to shame, eats away at his strength. It's like a decay in his bones. Maybe you know somebody that you just, man, he should have never married her. She is killing him, you know? But I don't think that it does any damage to the truth of this verse to flip the genders. You know, Solomon is a man and he's talking to his son. Well, I think that it is also correct 
to say that a man <coughs> should add dignity to his wife and should not be a decay to her bones, you know, but should be a, a, a source of dignity and a source of encouragement and a source of protection for her as well. How does your life impact others? Verse 5, the plans of the righteous are just, but the advice of the wicked is deceitful. Basically what he's saying is righteous people treat people in a righteous way, but when wicked people, even when wicked people give you advice, they're doing it to deceive you and manipulate you for their own good. How does your life impact other people? Verse 6, the words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the speech of the upright rescues them. Now when I first read that, I thought that the them, the speech of the upright rescues them, bounced back to the upright. That is, that the upright are rescued by their words. But that's not what the grammar is in this verse. It means that just as the words of wicked try to ruin people, the words of the righteous can come into that situation and deliver those who are being attacked by the wicked. I like that. It, it means that with our words, we can either be a, a ruiner, you know, if that's such a word, or a deliverer. And maybe you've had a situation like that where somebody's words was just tearing somebody just down. But you were able to step in and with some words of wisdom and God-inspired words, you were able to rescue them from that situation. You were able to maybe extricate them from, from that. You were able to encourage them and bring healing to them. The words of the upright, the speech of the upright, can be rescuing to those who are being attacked by the wicked. Oh, I like that. Be a rescuer. Be a deliverer by your words. Question number three. Are you righteous or wicked? How do you survive the storms of life? Verse three. No one can be established through wickedness, but the righteous cannot be uprooted. Interesting choice of words there. <coughs> the righteous cannot be uprooted because their root is in God. And if we really understand Christian fellowship the way we should, our roots should be entwined with one another. We all know about the giant sequoias, you know, the largest trees around. That root, their root system is actually pretty shallow, but it's very wide. They say that the root system of a sequoia tree branches out about a hundred yards, maybe in each direction. Now, that's the length of a football field. That's why they stand, because they're intertwined. And here's the secret to the sequoia. This sequoia does not fight with this sequoia over who gets the soils, nutrients, and who gets the water. Their root systems intertwine, and they share resources with each other. And so this sequoia here, his root system is intertwined with that sequoia and that sequoia and that one and that one. And all through that forest, those roots are intertwined and they stand. The reason they can survive the storms is because they're connected. And Solomon says the righteous cannot be uprooted because for us, our connection is most importantly with God, but then also with one another. It's one of the purposes of coming to church, is our root systems are to be intertwined with each other. That where one of us is weak, we come in on Sunday and somebody else strengthens us. When one of us is feeling discouraged, we walk into church and somebody encourages us because we're interconnected. That's what the biblical concept of fellowship is. How do you survive the storms of life? Verse 7, the wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous stands firm. There, there's a, the seed there of Jesus' story of the wise man and the foolish man. The wise men stand, the foolish man collapses. <coughs> and it's interesting to me that he says the house of the righteous stands firm. 
Some scholars believe that he's implying this. The people that you influence should learn how to handle the storms of life by observing how you handle them. You know, what, what do the people that watch us, what do they learn about handling the challenges of life? The house of the righteous stands firm. Verse 21, no harm overtakes the righteous. That doesn't seem true, does it? But the wicked have their fill of trouble. The last part of that verse basically means evil breeds evil. You know, wickedness breeds trouble. But the first part is what got me. No harm overtakes the righteous. Now, we know there's a difference between hurt and harm. You know, it, it, do doctors even give injections anymore? I know it, it's like they send you to the drugstore, but you used to go to the doctor and you're going to get a shot, you know. Um, and it, it hurt but it wasn't supposed to harm you. Now, well, maybe that's not what, that's what he's talking about, but, but then I, I found out this. It comes from an unused root word in the Hebrew language that means to exert yourself for nothing, to exert yourself in vain. And when I looked at that, no harm overtakes the righteous. Nothing happens to the righteous in vain. Nothing happens for no purpose. And that started getting me excited. Because that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. God is at work in all things for the good of those who love him. And if that's what Solomon is trying to say to us there, what he's saying is if you are righteous, nothing happens to you by accident. And nothing happens to you that doesn't have a purpose. That no harm is going to come to you. No quotation marks, good for nothing thing, is going to come to you. God is going to be able to turn it for good. And most of us have lived long enough to have seen that happen in our lives. That the things, even when we messed up, God was able to turn it around and, and give us ministry, give us an opportunity to share God's grace, give us a, a story to tell to people who needed to hear it, because God is working in everything for the good of those who love him. God has a plan for whatever comes into your life if you will stay connected to him. Nothing is wasted, nothing is in vain, nothing is good for nothing. We may not be able to figure out what it is, but we trust God and he knows what it is. One of my patients said to me this week, I know there's a purpose in this. I'm not sure what it is, but I know there's a purpose. And, and there's a certain peace that comes from knowing that no harm overtakes the righteous. There is a purpose to everything. God is working in it for our good. Now we're talking about how the righteous and the wicked handle the storms of life. Have you lived long enough to realize that sometimes the storms are people? <laughs> Have you ever had people cause you storms? Verse 16, fools show their annoyance at once but the prudent overlook an insult. You know those people that make a big deal out of everything? She didn't say hello to me. He looked at me wrong. He didn't ask me how I was doing, you know. And it just blows way, way, way out of proportion. <coughs> but the wise person ignores an insult. It's almost as if Solomon is saying, if people get under your skin so easily, how in the world do you expect to survive when the devil comes at you? you know, sometimes the storms are people, and we need to learn to overlook an insult. How are you doing on the test? Are you righteous? Are you wicked? Question number four, am I kind? Verse 10, the righteous care for the needs of their animals, but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. It's pretty self-explanatory. Are you kind? Verse 20. Deceit is in the hearts of those who plot evil, but those who promote peace have joy. Are you kind? What Solomon is saying is, evil people from their evil hearts <laughs> plot evil things toward others. But those who are righteous from their hearts promote peace. And that brings joy. And what's interesting is the grammar of that verse means 
they receive joy themselves and they pass on joy to others. So the question is, do I promote peace? Do I bring joy? <laughs> when you walk into a situation, does it become more peaceful or does it become more chaotic? Do you bring joy? Back when I was a smart aleck, and I realized none of you would ever think that I was ever a smart aleck, but back when I was a smart aleck, I used to have a sign in my office that said, everyone brings joy to this room. Some when they enter, some when they leave. <laughs> you know? But we need to be the people that bring joy. That When you walk into the room, people say, oh good, you're here. Are you kind? Question number five. Do I work honestly? Verse 11, those who work their land will have abundant food. Those who chase fantasies have no sense. <laughs> I, one person I was reading after said they should put that uh, verse over, you know, the New York Stock Exchange and all these, you know, those who chase fantasies have no sense. Verse 24, diligent hands will rule. Laziness ends in forced labor. In other words, if you don't work, they're going to make you work and it's not going to be pleasant. Verse 27, the lazy do not roast any game, but the diligent feed on the riches of the hunt. This, you may remember this verse from when we talked about the sluggard. Um, this is a weird verse. The New American Standard said, a slothful man does not roast his prey, but the precious possession of a man is diligence. I'm talking about working honestly and, and seeing a job through. Most scholars, when if they're brave enough to tackle this verse, say that it probably what he is saying is you may get a sluggard to go out and go hunting because of the thrill of the chase and you may he may actually catch something but when the thrill of the chase is over when the excitement of the crisis is over he never follows through and so yeah, he caught some game, but he's now he's just sitting in the corner staring at the wall, and he never gets around to cooking it. You may know people like that. They love the excitement of the chase. They love the thrill of the hunt. Boy, but, you know, but when it comes down to the daily stuff of life, they're just kind of sitting over in the corner staring, you know, because they never get around to the diligence of sticking to the job until it's done. And that's the positive trait. Do I work honestly? When somebody gives me a job to do, can they trust me that I'm going to be diligent to get the job done? The character trait of diligence. Do I work honestly? So how are you doing so far? Are you righteous or wicked? How do you react to discipline and correction? Does your, how does your life impact others? How do you survive the storms of life? Are you kind? Do you work honestly? It's amazing how practical the book of Proverbs is, isn't it? Number six, do I watch my words? Now, we just spent two weeks talking about watch your mouth. Solomon brings it up again. And there are a lot of verses in this chapter about our words. Verse 13, evildoers are trapped by their sinful talk. And so the innocent escape trouble. He's basically saying your words are either going to get you into trouble or they're going to help you stay out of trouble. Verse 14, from the fruit of their lips, people are filled with good things, and the work of their hands bring them rewards. This is, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow with your words, because from the fruit of your lips, you're filled with good things, and you reap what you sow with your work. The work of their hands bring them reward. It's Romans chapter 2, verse 6. God will repay each person according to what they've done. Solomon says... God will allow you to reap what you sow with your words and with your work. And then Solomon just continues through much of the rest of the chapter talking about our words. Verse 17, an honest witness tells the truth. A false witness tells lies. Verse 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The words of the reckless pierce like swords. You ever been in a conversation with somebody who was reckless with their words and how hurtful that could be? But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Do your words bring healing? 
Remember Paul says, don't let your words tear down, but let them build up. Do your words bring healing? Verse 19, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. Verse 22, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. Verse 23, the prudent keep their knowledge to themselves. A fool's heart blurts out folly. You don't have to say everything you know. Verse 25, I'm going to sit here for just a second. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Be an encourager. Righteous people are encouragers. Somebody said be a weightlifter. <laughs> people are carrying heavy burdens. Help lift them. One of my favorite New Testament minor characters is Barnabas. His name originally was not Barnabas, but the early disciples nicknamed him Barnabas. The word means encourager. Oh, huh. what would your nickname be? You know, here comes the critic, here comes the judge, here comes negative Nelly, you know. Uh, you know what, or here comes an encourager. Be an encourager. Let your words lift people, encourage people, give them hope. A kind word cheers up an anxious heart. <coughs> so how are you scoring? Are you righteous? Or are you wicked? <laughs> That's pretty important, not just for here, but for hereafter, because the Bible says in Psalm 9, the wicked will be turned into hell. So Solomon gives us three verses that help us kind of hang our hats on, on this chapter. Verse 2, good people or righteous people obtain favor from the Lord, but he condemns those who devise wicked schemes. If you want to receive favor from God, be a righteous person. And that word favor, I, I love it, because I thought it meant, well, God's blessing us. And that's true, the Bible teaches that. But that's not what this verse says. This verse, the grammar of this verse literally says, righteous people bring God joy. It's not that he gives us favor, although we know he does, and there are many other verses that say that. But this verse, the grammar says, as we live a righteous life, we bring him joy. The, the prophet said at one point, he rejoices over us. Have you asked, ever asked yourself if you're bringing God joy or not? You know, those of us who are parents know what it's like to feel pride in our children. I think our Heavenly Father enjoys feeling pride in us. Look at him go. You know, look at her. You know, she learned the lesson. She did good there, you know. And, and just, it brings him joy. Now, as we said when we began, the only way you become righteous is 2 Corinthians 5.21, and that is confess your unrighteousness and accept Christ's righteousness. That's how you become righteous. This chapter is telling us how to live it out, how to live out our righteousness in our daily lives. But it is true that the people we hang around with can either encourage or discourage us in our walk of righteousness. So Solomon says in verse 26, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Choose your friends carefully because they're going to impact how you live out your righteousness. Because ultimately and eternally, verse 28, in the way of righteousness there is life. Along that path is immortality. So in these two chapters, Proverbs 11 and 12, Solomon says there are two ways to live your life, righteously or wickedly, wisely or foolishly. In the way of righteousness, you not only receive God's blessing and favor now, you receive heaven forever. Choose righteousness. Father, thank you that your word gives us such practical insight into how we're supposed to live. We know that we do not become righteous by what we do. We become righteous by confessing our sins and accepting your righteousness. But we also know 
that you expect us to live out that righteousness in our practical daily lives. Thank you for the guidance of these chapters and how to do that and how to treat people and how to talk to people and, and how you help us survive when the storms of life come. So Lord, our, our world has so many warped ideas of what it means to be a follower of Christ. I pray that we would truly live righteous lives, lives that bring glory to you, lives that demonstrate what it means to be a follower of Christ so that people will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming out today. You're dismissed.